the twelve tables prefaced arranged translated annotated by p r coleman norton this is a librivox recording read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org introduction the legal history of rome begins properly with the twelve tables it is strictly the first and the only roman code collecting the earliest known laws of the roman people and forming the foundation of the whole fabric of roman law footnote the code was known under two titles lex duodecum tabularum law of the twelve tables and duodecum tabulae twelve tables in footnote its importance lies in the fact that by its promulgation was substituted for an unwritten usage of which the knowledge had been confined to some citizens of the community a public and written body of laws which were easily accessible to and strictly binding on all citizens of rome till the close of the republican period 509 b c to 27 b c the twelve tables were regarded as a great legal charter the historian Livy, 59 B.C. to A.D. 17, records, even in the present immense mass of legislation where laws are piled on laws, the twelve tables still form the fount of all public and private jurisprudence. Footnote. This claim that these statues were the source of all public and private law is exaggerated. Rather, the code is chiefly an exposition of private law derived from customary law, which already existed, and contained some public and religious law as well. For another estimate, see Cicero, where the advocate asserts that the small manual of the Twelve Tables by itself surpasses the libraries of all the philosophers both in weight of authority and in wealth of utility. In footnote. This celebrated code, after its compilation by a commission of ten men, Decimwiri, who composed in 451 B.C. ten sections, and two sections in 450 B.C., and after its ratification by the then principal assembly, Comitia Centuriata, of the state in 449 B.C., was engraved on twelve bronze tablets, whence the name Twelve Tables, which were attached to the rostra before the Curia in the Forum of Rome. Footnote. Such is the almost unanimous tradition but one source says ivory, iborias. Since some scholars scout the use of ivory in Rome at that time, the emendation of iborias to roborias, wooden, is suggested. In footnote. Though this important witness of the national progress probably was destroyed during the Gallic occupation of Rome in 387 B.C., yet copies must have been extant since cicero 106 b c to 43 b c says that in his boyhood schoolboys memorized these laws as a required formula footnote ut carmen necessarium End footnote however now no part of the twelve tables either in its original form or in its copies exists the surviving fragments of the twelve tables come from the writings of late Latin writers and fall into these four types. 1. Fragments which seem to contain the original words, or nearly so, of a law, modernized in spelling and to some extent in formation. 2. Fragments which are fused with the context of the quoter, but which otherwise exhibit little distortion. 3. Fragments which not only are fused with the sentences of the cider, but also are much distorted, although these preserve, in paraphrase, the purport of the provisions of a law. 4. Passages which present only an interpretation, or an opinion based on interpretation, or a title, or a convenient designation of a law. Only in very few cases do we know or can we conjecture the number of the tablet whereon any law appeared. Consequently, of the arrangement very little is ascertainable, and the attribution of some items to certain tablets is debatable. The probable order of the fragments, which total over 115, has been inferred from various statements and from other indications of ancient authors. 
The amount of detail apparently varies either with the importance of the matter or with the degree of general or particular knowledge of the subject supposed by the commissioners to be held commonly by the citizens. The style is characterized by such simplicity and by such brevity that the meaning in some instances borders upon obscurity, at least so far as modern interpretation is concerned. The value of the twelve tables consists not in any approach to symmetrical classification or even to terse clarity of expression, but in the publication of the method of procedure to be adopted, especially in civil cases, in the knowledge furnished to every Roman of high or low degree as to what were both his legal rights and his legal duties, in the political victory won by the plebeians, who compelled the codification and the promulgation of what had been largely customary law interpreted and administered by the patricians primarily in their own interests the twelve tables table one proceedings preliminary to trial one if he the plaintiff summon the defendant to court in eus he the defendant shall go if he the defendant go not he the plaintiff shall call a witness thereto then only he, the plaintiff, shall take the defendant by force. 2. If he, the defendant, attempt evasion or take to flight, he, the plaintiff, shall lay hand on the defendant. 3. If disease or old age shall be an impediment, he who shall summon the defendant to court in Eus shall grant him a conveyance. If he, the plaintiff, shall not wish, he, the plaintiff, shall not spread with cushions a covered carriage. 4. For a freeholder, taxpayer whose fortune is valued at not less than 1,500 azes, a freeholder shall be surety, windex, for his appearance at trial. Footnote. The oz originally was a bar one foot in length of ice, copper, then a weight, then a coin weighing one pound and worth about 17 cents. From time to time the Oz was reduced in weight and was depreciated in value, until by the provisions of the Lex Papyria in 191 B.C., the Oz weighed one-half ounce and was valued at eight thousandths of a dollar. End footnote. For a proletary, non-taxpayer whose fortune is rated at less than a freeholder's, anyone who shall be willing shall be a surety. Windex. 5. When they, the parties, come to terms, an official shall announce it. Footnote. Some scholars suggest that this statute should be translated thus. When the parties agree on preliminaries, each party shall plead. End footnote. 6. If they, the parties, agree not on terms, they shall state their case in the comedium, meeting place, or in the forum, market place, ere noon. Both parties shall appear in person and shall argue the matter. 7. If one of the parties shall not have appeared, after noon the judge shall adjudge the case, lease, in favor of him present. 8. If both parties be present, sunset shall be the time limit of the proceedings. 9. Both parties shall post sureties, wadis, and sub-sureties, sub-wadis, for their appearance. Table 2. Trial. 1. The legal action of solemn deposit, sacramenti actio, demands that each litigant shall wager either 500 azes or 50 azes. 500 azes for solemn deposit, sacramentum, when the subject of the dispute is valued at 1,000 azes or more. 50 azes when estimated at less than 1,000 azes. But if the controversy concerns the liberty of a human being, however valuable may be the person, the solemn deposit, sacramentum, shall be fifty azes. 2. A dangerous disease or a day appointed for the hearing of a case with an alien, when the latter is a party, if any of these circumstances be an impediment for judge, index, or arbitrator, arbiter, or party, reus, on this account the day of trial shall be deferred. Footnote. The index hears cases in which the fixed amount is to be adjudged. The arbiter hears cases in which an indefinite sum is to be assessed. At this time in the language reus means any litigant. In later Latin reus is restricted to signify the defendant. 
End footnote. Whoever shall have need of evidence, he shall go on every third day to cry before the doorway of the witness's house. Footnote. Perhaps on every other day, or on three market days, is meant. This means, we suppose, that the litigant requiring evidence must proclaim his need by shouting certain legal phrases before the residence of the person who is capable of supplying such evidence and who thereby is summoned to court. End footnote. Table 3. Debt. 1. Of debt acknowledged and for matters judged in court, in jure, thirty days shall be allowed by law for payment or for satisfaction. Footnote. Some scholars suggest that the Latin represented by the words and for matters in court should be omitted, and that the passage should open for persons judged liable for acknowledged debt, thus restricting the period of thirty days grace only to matters of debt. Even if this view be correct, it disproves not the probability that the thirty days applied to various kinds of cases. End footnote. 2. After that, a lapse of thirty days without payment, Hand shall be laid on, manus injectio, the debtor. He shall be brought into court, in ius. 3. Unless he the debtor discharge the debt or unless someone appear in court, in jure, to guarantee payment for him, he the creditor shall take the debtor with him. He shall bind him either with thong or with fetters, of which the weight shall not be less than fifteen pounds, or shall be more if he the creditor choose. 4. If he the debtor choose, he shall live on his own means. If he live not on his own means, the creditor who shall hold him in bonds shall give him a pound of bread daily. If he the creditor shall so desire, he shall give him more. 5. Unless they, the debtors, make a compromise, they, the debtors, shall be held in bonds for sixty days. During those days they shall be brought to the magistrate into the comedium, meeting place, on three successive market days, and the amount for which they have been judged liable shall be declared publicly. Moreover, on the third market day, they, the debtors, shall suffer capital punishment, capite poenae, or shall be delivered for sale beyond the Tiber River. 6. On the third market day, they, the creditors, shall cut pieces. Footnote. Shall cut pieces, partes secanto, is explained variously, to divide the debtor's functions or capabilities, to claim shares in the debtor's property, to divide the price obtained for the sale of the debtor's person, to divide the debtor's family and goods, to announce to the magistrate their shares of the debtor's estate. The old Roman writers, however, understand by the phrase that the creditors can cut their several shares of the debtor's body. If they shall have cut more or less than their shares, it shall be with impunity. Sine fraude. End footnote. Table 4. Paternal Power. 1. A dreadfully deformed child shall be killed quickly. 2. If a father thrice surrender a son for sale, the son shall be free from the father. Footnote. In primitive times a father can sell his son into slavery. If the buyer free the son, the son re-enters his father's control. Patria potestas. Here apparently we have an old formula surviving in a sham triple sale, whereby a descendant is liberated from the authority of an ascendant, or after a triple transfer and a triple manumission, the son is freed from his father and stands in his own right. Sui juris. End footnote. 3. To repudiate his wife, her husband shall order her to mind her own affairs, shall take her keys, shall expel her. 4. Into a legal inheritance he who has been in the womb, in utero, is admitted, if he shall have been born. Footnote. Otherwise, an interpretation probably, perhaps not a paraphrase, after ten months from the father's death, a child born shall not be admitted into a legal inheritance. End footnote. Table 5. Inheritance and Guardianship. 1. Women shall remain under guardianship, tutela, even though they shall become of full age, perfecta itis. The Vestal Virgins are accepted and shall be free from control. Footnote. Full age for females is twenty-five years. 
for keeping women of full age under a guardian almost no reason of any worth can be urged. The common belief that because of the levity of their disposition, propter anime levitatum, they often are deceived and therefore may be guided by a guardian, seems more plausible than true. According to Roman law of this period, a woman never has legal independence. If she be not under the power, potestas, of her father, she is dependent on the control, manus, of her husband, or, unmarried and fatherless, she is subject to the governance, tutela, of her guardian. In footnote. 2. The emancipable, conveyable, or movable possessions of a woman who is under tutelage of her agnates shall not be acquired rightfully by usucapion, long usage or long possession, save if these possessions by herself shall have been delivered with the sanction of her guardian, tutor. Footnote. Agnates, agnati, are relatives by blood or through adoption on male side only. Cognates, cognati, are blood relatives on either male or female side. The family of the use civila is the agnatic family. The family of the use gentium is the cognatic family. Besides a guardian tutor for a child of certain age, there is provided also a guardian, custos, later curator, for a lunatic and for a prodigal. In footnote. 3. According as a person shall have ordered regarding his property or the guardianship tutela of his estate, so shall be the law. Ita us esto. 4. If a person die intestate, intestatus, and have no self-successor, suus heiress, the deceased nearest male agnate shall have possession of the estate. 5. If there be no male agnate, the deceased clansman shall have possession of the estate. Footnote. Clansmen, gentiles, are persons all belonging to the same clan, gens, as the deceased's, and, of course, include agnates when these exist. In footnote. 6. To persons for whom a guardian tutor shall not have been appointed by will, testamentum, to them, their agnates shall be guardians. Footnote. Boys between the ages of seven and fifteen, girls between the ages of seven and thirteen, women neither under paternal power, patrio potestas, nor under marital control, in manu mariti. In footnote. 7. If a person be insane, furiosus, if there be not a guardian, custos for him, rightful authority over his person and over his property shall belong to his agnates, and in default of these, to his clansmen. If a person be a spendthrift, prodigus, he shall be prohibited from administering his own goods, and he shall be under the guardianship, curiato, of his agnates. 8. If a freedman, libertas, shall have died intestate without self-successor, his patron, patronus, shall take the inheritance of a Roman citizen freeman from said household into said household. 9. Items which are in the category of debts, due to or incurred by a deceased person, shall be divided among his consuccessors by mere operation of law, ipso jure, in proportion to their portions of the inheritance. Footnote. Another version of this provision reads thus. Debts bequeathed by inheritance shall be divided by automatic liability, ipso jure, proportionately among the heirs, after the details shall have been investigated, End footnote. 10. Apportionment of an estate, Actio Familiae Erciscundi, occurs when co-heirs, co wish to withdraw from common and equal participation in the inheritance. Footnote. That is, the judicial division of an estate by an index among the disagreeing co-heirs. End footnote. Table 6. Ownership and Possession. 1. When a person shall make bond, nexum, and conveyance, mancipium, according as he is specified with his tongue, so shall be the law. Ida us esto. 2. Both conveyance, mancipatio, 
and surrender in court in jure sessio are confirmed. 3. Articles which have been sold and delivered are not acquired by the buyer otherwise than if he has paid the price to the seller or has satisfied him in some other way, that is, by providing a guarantor, ex promisor, or a security, pignus. 4. It shall be sufficient to make good those faults which have been named by one's tongue, while for those flaws which he the vendor has denied expressly, when asked about these, he the vendor shall undergo a penalty of double damages. Footnote. That is, double the proportionate part of the price, or of the things transferred. In footnote. 5. For a loyal person, and for a person restored to allegiance, there shall be the same right, eus, of bond, nexum, and of conveyance, mancipium, with the Roman people. 6. Against an alien, hostis, title of ownership, octoritus, shall be valid forever. Footnote. This probably means that a foreigner resident in Roman territory never can obtain rights over any property simply by long possession, usucapio, thereof. But the meaning of octoritus in this clause is disputed. At any rate, usucapio is peculiar to Roman citizens. In footnote. 7. A prescriptive title usucapio of movable things is completed by one year's possession, but a prescriptive title of an estate and of buildings is completed by two years possession. 8. A person who had been a slave and who has been declared to be a free man, in a will on some condition, if he shall have given ten thousand Ozes to the heir, although he the slave has been alienated by the heir, by giving the money to the purchaser shall enter into his freedom. 9. If any woman not married by confariatio, footnote, this is an exclusively patrician type of wedding, wherein is made a mutual offering of bread in the presence of a priest and ten witnesses, end footnote, or by coemptio, footnote, this type of wedlock, used originally by plebeians, is a fictitious sale, by which a woman is freed from either patria potestas or tutela. It comes, perhaps, from the primitive custom of bride purchase. End footnote. Be unwilling to be subjected in this manner, by uses, possession, to the hand of her husband, in manumarity, she shall be absent from his house for three successive nights in every year, and by this means shall interrupt the uses, possession, of each year. Footnote. This method explains how a wife can remain married to a husband without remaining in his manus, rights of possession. If the uses be interrupted, the time of the uses must begin afresh, because the previous possession, uses, is considered as cancelled. In footnote. 10. If they, the parties, join their hands on the disputed property when pleading, in court, in jure, the actual possessor shall retain provisional possession. But, when it is a case of personal freedom, the magistrate shall grant the right of claim, vindicia, provisionally to the party asserting the person's freedom. 11. If he find that another has used his timber, tignum, in building a house or in supporting vines, a person shall not dislodge from the framework the timber, fixed in buildings, or in vineyard, but he shall have the right of action for double damages against him who has been convicted of fixing such timber. Footnote. Apparently tignum, as timber in English, covers material for construction, includes every kind of material used in buildings and in vineyards. In footnote. 12. Whenever the vines have been pruned, until fruit shall have been gathered therefrom, the owner shall not recover the timber. Table 7. Real Property 1. Ownership within a strip of five feet along a boundary shall not be acquired by long usage. Use a capio. Footnote. This strip is reserved as a path between any two estates belonging to different owners. Both owners can walk on the whole space, but neither owner can claim possession of the strip through continued usage. In footnote. 2. The way round each outer wall of a building shall be two and one-half feet. 3. If they, the parties, disagree, boundaries shall be marked by three arbitrators. Arbiter. Footnote. 
In view of the ancient tradition that the Decemvirs sent to Athens a committee to study the laws written by Solon, circa 639 B.C. to circa 559 B.C., for the Athenians, it may not be out of place to record what Gaius reports about marking boundaries. We must remember in an action for marking boundaries, Actio Finium Regendorum, that we must not overlook the old provision which was written in a manner after the pattern of the law which at Athens Solon is said to have given. For there it is thus, if any man erect a rough wall alongside another man's estate, he must not overstep the boundary. If he build a massive wall, he must leave one foot to spare, a building two feet. If he dig a trench or a hole, he must leave a space equal or about equal in breadth to depth. If a well six feet, an olive tree or a fig tree, he must plant nine feet from the other man's property, and any other trees five feet. While there is no evidence whatever that any enactment of the twelve tables reproduced in any form the terms of the Athenian statute here quoted, still the twelve tables may have contained some such provisions. End footnote. 4. Enclosures, inherited plots, cottages. Footnote. What were these conditions we know not? All that we have from this item are these words, which are quoted as examples of how words change their meanings and which are assigned to the twelve tables. End footnote. 5. The width of a road extends to eight feet on a straight stretch, but it extends to sixteen feet on a bend. 6. Neighboring persons shall mend the roadway. If they keep it not laid with stones, one shall drive one's beast vehicles across the land where one shall wish. 7. If rainwater do damage, through artificial diversion from its natural channels, the offending owner shall be restrained by an arbitrator. Arbiter. 8. If a water course directed through a public place shall do damage to a private person, to the same private person shall be the right to bring an action, actio, that damage shall be repaired for the owner. 9. Branches of a tree may be lopped all around to a height of fifteen feet. Footnote. Some scholars suppose that only branches over fifteen feet above ground are meant. In any case, the idea is that shade from the tree may not damage a neighboring estate. End footnote. If a tree on a neighbor's farm be bent crooked by the wind and lean over one's farm, one can take legal action, agare, for removal of that tree or at least of the offending part of it. 10. The owner of a tree may gather its fruit which falls upon another's farm. Table 8. Torts or Delicts. 1. If any person had sung or had composed a song which caused slander or insult to another person, he should be clubbed to death. Footnote. We know that this item was interpreted to include prose as well as verse. Slander and libel are not distinguished from each other in Roman law. The severity of the penalty indicates that the Romans viewed offense not as a private delict, but as a breach of the public peace. End footnote. 2. A person who has sung an evil spell. Footnote. Apparently an incantation against a person. For the ninth statute in this table treats such practice against property. End footnote. 3. If a person has broken another's limb, membrum, Unless he make agreement for compensation with him, there shall be retaliation in kind. Talio. Footnote. The penalty points to an incurable maim or break, because the next statute seems to provide for injuries which can be mended. The injured person or his next of kin may maim or break limb for limb. Compare the mosaic lex talionis recorded in Leviticus 24, 17 through 21. End footnote. 4. If a person has broken or has bruised a bone with hand club, he shall undergo a penalty of 300 ozes if to an injured freeman, or of 150 ozes if to an injured slave. 5. If a person shall have done simple harm, in uria, to another, penalty shall be 25 ozes. 6. 6. If a person shall have caused loss, 
Footnote. Most scholars connect this fragment with damage to property and conjecture that the rest of it must have been concerned with compensation for accidental damage. In footnote. 7. If a quadruped shall be said to have caused damage, pauperies, legal action, actio, shall be sanctioned either for the surrender of the thing which made the damage, or for the offer of assessment for the damage. Footnote. That is, the animal which committed the damage may be surrendered to the aggrieved person. End footnote. 8. If a person pasture his cattle on a neighbor's land, he shall be liable to a legal action. Footnote. From the context, we can reconstruct the sense of this statute. End footnote. 9. He who has enchanted crops. Footnote. Not apparently into one's own fields, but to destroy these where these were. End footnote. Nor should he decoy another's corn. Footnote. Apparently into one's own fields by means of magical incantation. End footnote. 10. For pasturing on, or for cutting secretly by night another's crops acquired by tillage, shall be in the case of an adult hanging in death, by sacrifice to Ceres, a person under the age of puberty, under fifteen years of age, shall either be scourged at the discretion of the magistrate, or make composition by paying double damages for the harm done. Footnote. Ceres. Properly the goddess of creation, occasionally by extension the goddess of marriage, usually the goddess of agriculture, especially the goddess of cultivation of grain and of growth of fruits in general. Ceres is represented commonly as a matronly woman, always clad in full attire of flowing draperies, crowned either with a simple riband or with ears of grain holding in her hand sometimes a poppy, sometimes a scepter, sometimes a sickle, sometimes a sheaf of grain, sometimes a torch, sometimes a basket full of fruits or of flowers, seated or standing in a chariot drawn by dragons or by horses. End footnote. 11. Who shall have destroyed by burning a building or a stack of corn set alongside a house is ordered to be bound, scourged, burned to death, provided that knowingly and consciously he shall have committed this? But if this be by accident, that is, by negligence, either he is ordered to repair the damage, or if he be too poor to be competent for such punishment, he shall be chastised more lightly. 12. Any person who shall have felled wrongfully, in Uria, other person's trees, shall pay twenty-five ozes for every tree. 13. If theft has been done by night, if owner has killed him, the thief, he the thief shall be held killed lawfully. Ure. 14. It is forbidden that a thief be killed by day, unless he the thief defend himself with a weapon, even though he the thief shall have come with a weapon, unless he the thief shall use that weapon and shall resist, you shall not kill him. And even if he the thief resist, you shall shout, that some persons may hear and assemble. Footnote. That is, the slayer must call aloud, lest he be considered a murderer trying to hide his own act. Our sources leave it uncertain whether the law forbids that a thief be killed by day unless he defend himself with a weapon, or the law permits that a thief be killed if he so defend himself. End footnote. 15. In the case of all other thieves caught in the act, it is ordained that freemen be scourged and be adjudged as bondsmen to the person against whom the theft has been committed, provided that they had done this by day and had not defended themselves with a weapon, that slaves caught in the act of theft be whipped with scourges and be thrown from the rock. Footnote. A southern spur of the Capitoline Hill, which overlooks the Forum, and named after Tarpeia, a legendary traitress who, tempted by golden ornaments of besieging Sabines, opened to them the gate of the citadel of which her father was a governor during the regal period. As they entered, the enemy by their shields crushed her to death. Tarpeia was buried on the Capitoline Hill, whereupon stood the citadel, and her memory was preserved by the name of the Tarpeian Rock. Rupus Tarpeia, when certain classes of condemned criminals in later times were thrown to their death. 
End footnote. That boys below the age of puberty, under fifteen years old, be flogged at the magistrate's discretion, and that damage done by them be repaired. 16. Thefts which have been discovered through use of platter and loincloth shall be punished just as if the culprits had been caught in the act. For cases of stolen goods discovered, furtum conceptum, by other means than by platter and loincloth, or introduced, furtum oblatum, the penalty is triple damages. Footnote. Our sources tell us that a person who searched for stolen property on the premises of another, searched alone and naked, lest he be deemed later to have brought concealed in his clothing any article which he might pretend then to have found in the house, save for a loincloth and a platter, on the latter of which he probably placed the stolen articles when found. We hear also that a man could institute a search in normal dress, but only in the presence of witnesses. If in the latter case stolen goods were discovered, the thief on conviction was condemned to pay thrice their value for furtum conceptum, detected theft. But in either case, if the accused householder could prove that a person other than himself for any reason had placed the stolen articles in his house, he could obtain from that person on conviction damages of thrice their value for furtum oblatum, planted theft. Search by platter and loincloth, lanx et lichium, became obsolete, search with witnesses present survived. End footnote. 17. If a person plead on case of theft in which the thief shall not be caught in the act, the thief shall compound for the loss by paying double damages. Footnote. The ancient commentators take this statute to mean double in kind, not in value. For example, two cows surrendered for one cow stolen. End footnote. 18. A stolen thing is debarred from prescription. Use a capio. Footnote. That is, neither a thief nor a receiver of stolen goods, whether acquired through purchase or by other method, can acquire title to property in stolen goods through long possession of such. End footnote. 19. No person shall practice usury at a rate of more than one-twelfth. If he do, a usurer shall be condemned for quadruple damages. Footnote. The uncia, whence our ounce is the unit of division as of the as, and is used also as one-twelfth of anything. One-twelfth of the principal paid yearly as interest equals eight and one-third per cent. End footnote. 20. In a suit concerning an article deposited with a person who has failed to return the article, legal action, actio, for double damages is granted. 21. If guardians, tutor a curator, be suspected of maladministration, there is the right to accuse them on suspicion. The legal action, actio, against guardians, tutor, shall be for double damages. 22. If a patron, Patronus, shall have defrauded a client, clients, he shall be forfeited solemnly. Saker. Footnote. This originally is a religious penalty whereby the person is sacrificed, but Saker comes to mean a person disgraced and outlawed and deprived of his property. In footnote. 23. Whoever shall have allowed himself to be called as a witness, or shall have been a scales-bearer, Libra pens, if he has, as a witness, pronounced not his testimony, he shall be dishonored and incapable of giving evidence, in testabilis. Footnote. At a sale, mancapicium or mancapatio, the buyer in the presence of five adult citizens had his money weighed by another adult citizen who held scales for this purpose. The practice obtained originally ere the introduction of coinage. End footnote. 24. The penalty for false testimonies is that any person who has been convicted of speaking false witness shall be precipitated from the Tarpeian rock. 25. If a weapon has sped from one's hand rather than if the wielder has hurled it, he shall atone for the accidental deed by providing the substitution of a ram as a peace offering to prevent blood revenge. 
26. For administering a noxious drug. 27. No person shall hold nocturnal meetings in the city. 28. Members of guilds have the power to make for themselves any binding rule which they may wish, provided that they violate nothing in accordance with public law. Publica Lex. Table 9. Public Law. 1. Laws of personal exemption, privilegium, shall not be proposed. Footnote. That is, enactments referring to a single citizen whether or not in his favor. End footnote. 2. Laws concerning the person caput, of a citizen shall not be passed except by the greatest assembly, maximus comitatus, and through those whom they, the consuls, have placed upon the registers of the citizenry. Footnote. Caput includes also privileges of citizenship. Kiwitas. The greatest assembly, commonly known as the Comitia Centuriata, was an assembly which comprised all citizens. To this assembly, a citizen convicted in court on a capital charge had the right of appeal, jus provocationis, at least as early as the passage of the Lex Valeria in 509 B.C., for Cicero claims that the pontifical, as well as the augural books, state that the right of appeal from the regal sentences had been recognized. This statue is quoted by Cicero, who inserts censores, censors as the subject of the last verb locusint have placed but the last clause must have been modernized either by cicero or in his source because the promulgation of the twelve tables in 449 b c antedated the creation of the censorship which cannot be traced higher than 443 b c if we can believe livy's account of its institution before that time the consuls superintended the lists of citizens. End footnote. 3. A judge, eudex, or an arbitrator, arbiter, legally, jure, appointed, who has been convicted of receiving money for declaring a decision, shall be punished capitally, capite. 4. Provisions pertaining to the investigators of murder, quaestor perisidi, appointed to have charge over capital cases. 5. Whoever shall have incited a public enemy, hostis, or whoever shall have delivered a citizen kiwis to a public enemy, shall be punished capitally, capite. 6. It is forbidden to put to death unconvicted any one whomsoever. Table 10. Sacred Law. 1. A dead person shall not be buried or burned in the city. Footnote. The first provision doubtlessly descends from a primitive tribal taboo. Cicero supposes that the second provision is due to danger from fire. End footnote. 2. More than this shall not be done. The funeral pyre, rogum, shall not be smoothed with the axe. Footnote. In view of the simplicity enjoined in some of the following statutes of this table, for the Deccan Weirs apparently took a dim view of extravagant funerals. This statute seems to mean that a rough-hewn pyre without elaborate smoothness of its wooden material suffices for the cremation couch of a citizen. End footnote. 3. Expenses of a funeral shall be limited to three mourners wearing veils, and one mourner wearing small purple tunic and ten flute players. 4. Women shall not tear their cheeks, or have a lessus, sorrowful outcry, on account of the funeral. Footnote. Cicero says that some older interpreters suspected that some kind of mourning garment was meant by lessus, but that he inclines to the interpretation that it signifies a sort of sorrowful wailing. End footnote. 5. The bones of a dead person shall not be collected that one may make a funeral afterward. Footnote. This provision is aimed at the common custom of prolonging mourning by gathering and preserving unburied some part of the corpse. When this part, os resectum, later had been buried, then only mourning ceased. It is possible that some Romans may have thought that cremation might be wrong, or that its ceremony was inadequate. End footnote. An exception is for death in battle or on foreign soil. Footnote. 
that is in such a case a limb could be carried to rome and then buried in footnote six anointing by slaves and every kind of drinking bout is abolished there shall be no costly sprinkling no myrrh spiced drink no long garlands no incense boxes seven whoever wins a crown corona himself footnote that is a garland or a chaplet or a wreath as a prize of achievement in footnote or through his chattel footnote a chattel for example is a slave or a horse who wins a wreath for the owner in footnote or by his valor a crown is bestowed on him when he is burned or buried on him who has won it and on his father it shall be laid with impunity sine fraude eight this also shall not be done to make more than one funeral and to spread more than one beer for one person nine gold shall not be added to a corpse but him whose teeth shall have been fastened with gold if a person shall bury or shall burn him with that gold it shall be with impunity sine fraude ten it is forbidden for a new pyre rogum or a burning mound bustum to be erected nearer than sixty feet to another person's buildings without the owner's consent footnote cicero says that this statute seems to suggest fear of disastrous fire End footnote. 11. It is forbidden for a vestibule of a sepulchre, forum, and a burning mound, bustum, to be acquired by usucapion. Footnote. In the burning mound also ashes were buried. End footnote. Table 11. Supplementary Laws. 1. Intermarriage, connubium, between plebeians and patricians shall not occur. Footnote. This statute proved so unpopular that it soon was repealed by the Lex Canulia in 445 B.C. End footnote. 2. Regulations concerning intercalation. 3. Declaration concerning days deemed favorable for official legal action. D.A.'s agendae. Table 12. Supplementary Laws. 1. There shall lie a levy of distress, pignoris capio, against a person who has bought an animal for sacrifice and pays not the price likewise against a person who makes not payment for that yoke beast which any one has lent for this purpose that therefrom he may raise money to spend on a sacred banquet sacrifice footnote this process of taking a pledge is the seizure and the detention of a debtor's property or part thereof to induce the debtor to pay the debt before any other legal action will be taken it will be noticed that the two instances given in this statute concern sacred law, with which, by anticipation, the fourth statute of this table likewise is concerned. Modern scholars place these two provisions among the supplementary laws, despite the temptation to set these among the statutes of Table 10, of which all but one item come from Cicero's discussion of sacred law, in the concluding portion of which cicero seems to speak with some finality that he has given all the regulations regarding religion found in the twelve tables moreover these two rules come from gaius who flourished more than two centuries after cicero but if every supplementary law resembling the subject matter of tables one through ten should be advanced to the appropriate position forward few would be the statutes left in tables eleven and twelve it is merely coincidental that some of the statutes among the supplementary laws should concern topics already treated, for, from the Romans, we must not remove the faculty of aftersight. In footnote. 2. If a slave shall have committed theft or shall have done damage with his master's knowledge, the action for damages, actio noxalis, is in the slave's name arising from delicts committed by children and by slaves of a household actions for damages axio noxalis shall be appointed that the father or the master can be allowed either to undergo assessment of the suit litis istimatio or to deliver the delinquent for punishment footnote some scholars seek to place this provision in table eight where it seems properly to belong despite its traditional position here this dislocation coupled with that of the preceding provision well illustrates how hopeless is our reconstruction of the order of the regulations of the twelve tables End footnote. three 
if a person has taken a thing by false claim footnote that is apparently if a person with or without fraudulent intent had held and claimed as his a thing which a judicial court now decided belonged to another party in footnote if he should wish the magistrates shall grant three arbitrators arbiter by their adverse arbitration arbitrarium the defendant shall compound for loss caused by paying double damages from enjoyment of the article footnote retention of the article is deemed to have brought the defendant some profit therefore he must pay double this profit End footnote four it is forbidden to dedicate for consecrated use in sacrum anything of which there is a controversy about its ownership otherwise a penalty of double the amount involved shall be suffered five whatsoever last the people have ordained this shall be binding and valid jus retumque footnote that is the most recent law repeals all previous laws which are inconsistent with it End footnote unplaced fragments there are extant about a dozen fragments of whose place in the twelve tables we are ignorant in nearly every instance these fragments consist of only one word or phrase which later latin antiquarians have preserved to illustrate an ancient spelling or to explain an archaic usage or to point a definition the longest fragment only is worth reproduction for the present purpose to appeal from any judgment iniquium and sentence poena is allowed footnote cicero says that many laws in the twelve tables exhibit this rule in footnote end of the twelve tables prefaced arranged translated annotated by p r coleman norton read by philip gould the cost of living in the twelfth century by dana c monroe reprinted from proceedings american philosophical society volume one nineteen eleven read april the twentieth nineteen eleven this is a librivox recording read in honour of the twelfth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org as yet it is impossible to make any statement of the average cost of living in the twelfth century in any country of europe much material is accessible in the pipe rolls and similar accounts in the charters and other legal documents of which so many thousands have been preserved but no one has attempted a careful statistical study for this period thorold rogers began his work on the prices in england with the year twelve fifty nine Kurschmann collected some items for germany during the years eleven ninety to twelve twenty five lamprecht gathered some data on prices for france in the eleventh century and there are some other partial statements whether it will be possible to make an accurate estimate can only be ascertained after minute and extended examination of the accessible material but it is possible to gather some examples which are illuminating in eleven eighty one the former mistress of henry the second and the mother of geoffrey was receiving an annual pension of twenty marks or thirteen pounds six shillings and eightpence in the same year the archbishop of norway who was then visiting in england was allowed by the king ten shillings a day for the expenses of himself and suite the same amount was allowed in eleven eighty to the abbot of glastonbury evidently ten shillings a day was considered sufficient for the expenses of a high church official and his attendants probably the pension of twenty marks or a little over eightpence a day was sufficient for the expenses of a lady and her servant this is rendered more probable by the fact that richard the lionheart when he hired vessels for his crusade had to pay only twopence a day to sailors and fourpence a day to the captains in twelve o one the french ambassadors made a treaty with venice by which the latter agreed to carry the crusaders across the sea and furnish them with provisions for a year on the payments of two marks for each man and four marks for each horse footnote 
de Vailly estimates a mark as equivalent to fifty-two francs at the present day, that is, two marks would be equivalent roughly to a hundred and four francs, or twenty dollars. Of course, this is entirely misleading, as it would be impossible to furnish transportation and food for a year for twenty dollars per individual. End footnote. The prices current at the time throw some light upon the above. In Lincolnshire in 1181, a goose cost a penny, a sheep fourpence, an ox three shillings, a farm horse five shillings, a pig one shilling, scarlet cloth six and eightpence an ell, fine green cloth three shillings, grey one shilling and eightpence blankets three shillings an ell thus if geoffrey's mother had expended her pension in buying livestock she could have bought twenty-five horses twenty-five oxen twenty-five pigs twenty-five sheep and a hundred geese or if she had preferred she could have bought fifty yards of scarlet cloth say enough for four or five dresses in the fashion of the day the difference in cost between the necessities and the luxuries is very noticeable while it is impossible to state the exact cost of living it is certain that this cost was increasing rapidly for the upper classes and probably for the middle classes the rise was due to a variety of causes and it would be easy to make out a long list including war famine and pestilence but two appear to have been especially important first there was a change in the standard of living acquaintance with the east through the crusades led to a desire for the luxuries which were produced at constantinople and in asia before the first expeditions to the holy land spices had been used only to a slight extent in the west of europe at the capture of caesarea in 1101 the genoese received over sixteen thousand pounds of pepper as a portion of their booty this and other spices soon came into general use and were imported into western europe in great quantities the references in the literature of the day point conclusively to the widespread use of spices and their great popularity the costly fabrics of the east were also in great demand and the heroines of the poems are frequently described as clad in the stuffs made in constantinople or farther eastward no lady was considered well dressed by the poet unless she had garments imported from the east oriental rugs became so fashionable that a manufactory for them was established in paris glassware sugar dye-stuffs and other oriental products were coveted and secured as far as possible life as a whole became more luxurious in germany four meals a day supplanted the three of an earlier period and the ideal hero was a mighty trencherman According to the pseudo Turpin, Charles the Great ate quote, a whole quarter of a lamb, two fowls, a goose, or a large portion of pork, a peacock, a crane, or a whole hare end quote, at a meal. Luxury in dress, at least among the middle classes, was not confined wholly to the Oriental products fashion began its despotic sway for germany and other parts of western europe in the twelfth century and those who could not afford the byzantine stuffs might in their domestic weaves imitate the prevailing styles of long trains and full sleeves almost sweeping the ground shoes for both men and women changed in style almost every year sometimes the toes were long and pointed extending up toward the knees at other times short and broad other items of extravagance might be mentioned such as the enormous head-dresses wigs and other false hair but enough has been indicated another great source of expenditure was building 
the monarchs spent large sums on their castles and residence halls and the nobles and citizens followed their lead palaces cathedrals fortresses country houses town halls hospitals and other edifices were going up in all the leading centres the cost of building was greatly increased by the general substitution of stone for wood and by the frequent use of lead for the roofs great quantities of this metal were exported from england to various places in france and even to other parts of europe the second cause of the rise in the cost of living was the increase in the amount of money available western europe was just changing from natural to geldwirtschaft the author of the dialogus de scaccario who wrote about the beginning of the last quarter of the twelfth century says that he had been told of the former custom by which all payments to the treasury were made in kind and that he had seen a man who had witnessed the bringing in of the provisions from the various parts of the country in fact in the reign of henry i of england the sheriffs obtained their receipts for so many fowls eggs ducks hogs oxen etc or so much beer wool corn or other grain but this practice had not wholly gone out under henry the second in spite of the statement of the author of the dialogus in the pipe roll of eleven eighty one eighty two for instance there is the record of the payment by cheshire of forty cows in addition to their money dues on the whole however all through western europe payments in money were superseding payments in kind and this was due mainly to the increase in the amount of the circulating medium large numbers of coins were brought home from the east in the scandinavian lands it is said that more than twenty five thousand arabic coins have been dug up in recent times in the literature of the twelfth century arabian gold is very frequently referred to and is contrasted with the lighter coloured gold of the west at the capture of caesarea in eleven o one when the pepper was obtained the genoese secured over four hundred thousand solidi of poitou and they received only one-third of the booty the crusaders were always keen for gold whenever they won a victory they sought anxiously for the precious metals frequently they cut open the bodies of the slain enemies because they believed the latter had swallowed their coins sometimes they made great heaps of the bodies and burned them in order to obtain the gold which had been secreted many similar facts might be cited which would illustrate the enrichment of the west by the coins brought in from the east far more important probably was the coinage and use of the precious metals which had previously been hoarded especially in ornaments and works of art until about the close of the eleventh century there had been comparatively little occasion for a large stock of ready money but when the crusaders made their preparations for their long expeditions they needed large sums of money both for their equipment and for their journey even the participants in the so-called peasants crusade took enough money with them to pay all the expenses for several months when they marched under the leadership of walter the penniless and peter the hermit because of the demand for coins the mints of the west were very active in the twelfth century under henry the first of england ninety-four minters were busy in eleven twenty five all the ninety-four were called up for punishment on the ground that they had debased the coinage and each one had his right hand struck off under henry the second there was a great amount of coining of which the details may be followed in the pipe rolls as far as they are accessible in addition instruments of credit came into use especially bills of exchange which greatly increased the amount of capital the templars in their house at paris received deposits and gave orders upon their house in jerusalem 
in doing this they were probably imitating the example of the jews who had long used such papers and we find the example of the templars or of the jews imitated by others so that for instance by eleven eighty eight bills of exchange had become very common in hamburg the extravagance of the age is well depicted in the literature the knightly hero is always lavish in his gifts and entertainments as well as in his attire sumptuous banquets where the boards literally groaned under the weight of the dishes were the fashion large stone castles were built and richly adorned and in these the number of attendants increased greatly the armour became more costly the legal expenses from which the nobles were never free mounted up but the main source of outgo was the necessity of keeping up the style of living demanded by the fashion of the day consequently the knight had to spend much more and the minstrels sang only of those who were generous even the fathers and mothers in their advice urged their sons to give freely and never to be niggardly there were great opportunities to acquire wealth one of the men who improved his chances to the best advantage was suger he was of peasant stock and was educated at the monastery of saint denis where he became intimate with the prince who later was known as louis the sixth of france the intimacy always continued and after the death of louis the sixth suger who was then abbot of saint denis acted as regent of france during the absence of louis the seventh on the crusade during the time of the king's expedition suger paid all the expenses of the kingdom of france out of his own fortune he had previously restored and beautified the church of saint denis at his own expense and he still had enough wealth so that in the last year of his life he planned to equip and finance a crusade wholly from his own money suger was able to acquire this enormous fortune because of his great ability and because he understood the economic conditions of the time the average noble had no genius for acquiring wealth and his feudal income which was fixed mainly by custom appears to have been stationary or even declining with the establishment of better order and the increase of the royal power the nobles had lost both their opportunity to plunder and the right of private coinage which greatly lessened their income one feature of the pipe roll for eleven eighty one to eleven eighty two is very significant in this connection about three hundred debtors to the king were listed from various parts of england most of whom had disappeared or were destitute of means so that these debts could not be collected apparently most of the individuals came from the lesser nobility the only resource for men of this class was to borrow at usury the usurers formed one of the two classes of wrongdoers against whom the preaching of the twelfth century was especially directed they were evidently very numerous and they preyed chiefly upon the nobles the merchants and the peasants seldom had to resort to the usurers there were many christians engaged in this business but more jews and the latter were to suffer severely as the result of the economic conditions the rate of interest in england when the security was good was twopence on the pound each week compounded once in six weeks or about fifty two per cent a year much more was demanded when the security was not good consequently if a knight borrowed forty pounds a sum frequently in excess of the annual income of a knight and was unable to pay the interest in a year he would owe sixty pounds and sixteen shillings in two years over ninety two pounds in three years over a hundred and forty pounds in five years over three hundred and twenty four pounds and the interest then would be over three pounds a week probably the ill feeling against the jews was due very largely to the anger of the borrowers who found themselves hopelessly involved in debt 
there is a very decided change in the attitude toward the jews in the twelfth century and it is significant that the preparations for the crusades when ready money was especially needed were so frequently accompanied by a persecution of the jews for instance in ten ninety six in eleven forty seven in eleven eighty nine their great wealth is shown by the fact that the jews of england contributed sixty thousand pounds towards the crusade of henry the second and all others only seventy thousand there is no estimate of the number who contributed this sixty thousand pounds but there had been a great increase since the beginning of the reign of henry the second at that time all jews who died in england had to be buried in the cemetery near london at the end of henry the second's reign almost every great town had a jewish cemetery in the suburbs the peasants both in town and country gained in prosperity during the twelfth century the agricultural labourers profited by the opening of more markets for their products they were sometimes able to hire the demean land and even to rent the mill or the whole manor because the lord of the manor was in need of ready money in france many villeneuve were established which offered special privileges in order to attract tenants suger's example in emancipating his serfs was followed more and more frequently by the kings and by the lords in england many individuals escaped to the towns and if they were able to remain there unmolested for a year and a day they were free from all possibility of pursuit the merchants in the towns profited most the lombard cities of italy gained great wealth by the carrying both of crusaders and of wares the trade extended widely in western europe fairs were established where the commodities of the whole known world were offered for sale by the merchants from the various countries who travelled about from place to place the increase in the dues which the lords received from these fairs bears witness to their prosperity and to the enlarged trade of which they were the scene gross states that the guild merchant first appeared in england about eleven hundred and that the craft society first appeared on the continent as in england early in the twelfth century if we connect these statements with ashley's dictum Quote, trade as an independent occupation grew up first in the service of luxury end quote. the importance of the change in the standard of living will be apparent the establishment of uniform weights and measures and the universality of certain standards of money such as the cologne mark the venetian ducat or the bezant also indicate the rapid advance in commerce the fabliau or laughable stories told in verse the especial literature of the merchant class began about the middle of the twelfth century in these tales class consciousness is very evident they ridiculed the knights and the clergy while always depicting the latter as wealthy some of these fabliau which were written for the merchants of the twelfth century sound curiously modern as if they might have been told in the nineteenth century in our own western states they are frequently irreverent and show an independence of thought which is very noteworthy in this early period their attitude toward women is entirely at variance with that of the courtly literature of the age in fact the merchants were thinking for themselves and were no longer willing to be subservient to the nobility and the clergy they were rapidly becoming important political factors and were winning recognition from the monarchs they were vying in comfort and luxury with the nobles and frequently ineffective sumptuary laws were enacted to restrict these nouveaux riches as yet too little attention has been paid to this change in the standard of living and its effects 
in this paper an attempt has been made to set forth only a few of the facts merely to indicate the nature and importance of the problem every one of the subjects here discussed is susceptible of elaboration and needs to be worked out in detail for each country of western europe and each period in the twelfth century the material is voluminous as indicated above the legal documents should be utilized for the definite statements which they contain and the literature of the age should be laid under contribution for its information as to the character customs and points of view of the various classes the chronicles unfortunately will furnish comparatively little because they generally give only the unusual events statements about prices drawn from them are frequently of little value because the figures are given on account of their extreme highness or lowness this field as a whole offers a good opportunity for many monographs and such work is essential before we can understand the economic history of the century which was most important in the advance of western europe End of The Cost of Living in the Twelfth Century by Dana C. Monroe. Read by Ruth Golding. A Dozen at a Blow by Joseph Jacobs. This is a LibriVox recording read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A little tailor was sitting cross-legged at his bench, and was stitching away as busy as could be when a woman came up the street calling out, Homemade jam! Homemade jam! So the tailor called out to her, Come here, my good woman, and give me a quarter of a pound. And when she had poured it out for him, he spread it on some bread and butter, and laid it aside for his lunch but in the summer time the flies commenced to collect around the bread and jam when the tailor noticed this he raised his leather strap and brought it down upon the crowd of flies and killed twelve of them straightway he was mighty proud of that so he made himself a shoulder sash on which he stitched the letters a dozen at one blow when he looked down upon this he thought to himself a man who could do such things ought not to stay at home he ought to go out to conquer the world. So he put into his wallet the cream cheese that he had bought that day, and a favorite blackbird that used to hop about his shop, and went out to seek his fortune. He hadn't gone far when he met a giant, and went up to him and said, Well, comrade, how goes it with you? Comrade, sneered the giant, a pretty comrade you would make for me. Look at this, said the tailor, pointing to his sash. And when the giant read, a dozen at a blow, he thought to himself, This little fellow is no fool of a fighter, if what he says is true. But let's test him. So the giant said to the tailor, If what you've got there is true, we may well be comrades. But let's see if you can do what I can do. And he bent down in the road and took up a large stone and pressed it with his hand till it all crushed up and water commenced to pour out from it. Can you do that? said the giant. The tailor also bent down in the road, but took out from his wallet the piece of cheese and pretended to pick it up. When he took it in his hand, he pressed and pressed, till the cream poured forth from it. The giant said, Well, you can do that fairly well. Let's see if you can throw. He took another stone and threw it till it went right across the river by which they were standing. So the little tailor took his blackbird in his hand and pretended to throw it, and, of course, when it felt itself in the air, it flew away and disappeared. The giant said, That wasn't a bad throw. You may as well come home and stop with us giants, and we'll do great things together. As they went along, the giant said, We want some twigs for our night fires. You may as well help me carry some home. And he pointed to a tree that had fallen by the wayside and said, Help me carry that, will you? So the tailor said, Why, certainly and went to the top of the tree and said, I'll carry these branches, which are the heavier. You carry the trunk, which has no branches. And when the giant got the trunk on his shoulders, the tailor seated himself on one of the branches and let the giant carry him along. 
After a time the giant got tired and said, Ho oh, there, wait a minute. I'm going to drop the tree and rest a while. So the tailor jumped down and caught the tree around the branches again and said, Well, you are easily tired. At last they got to the giant's castle, and there the giant spoke to his brothers and told them what a brave and powerful fellow this little tailor was. They spoke together and determined to get rid of him, lest he might do them some harm. But they determined to kill him in the night, because he was so strong and might kill twelve of them at a blow. But the tailor saw them whispering together, and guessing that something was wrong, went out into the yard and got a big bladder which he filled with blood, and put it in the bed which the giants pointed out to him. Then he crept under it, and during the night they brought their big clubs and hit the bed over and over again till the blood spurted out into their faces. Then they thought the tailor was dead and went back to sleep. But in the morning there was a tailor as large as life, and they were so surprised to see him that they asked him if he had not felt anything during the night. Oh, I don't know. There seemed to be plenty of fleas in that bed, said the tailor. I do not think I would care to sleep there again. And with that he took his leave of the giants and went on his way. After a time he came to the king's court and fell asleep under a tree, and some of the courtiers passing by saw written upon his sash a dozen at one blow. They went and told the king, who said, Why, he's just the man for us. He will be able to destroy the wild boar and the unicorn that are ravaging our kingdom. Bring him to us. So they woke up the little tailor and brought him to the king, who said to him, There is a wild boar ravaging our kingdom. You are so powerful that you will easily be able to capture it. What shall I get if I do? asked the little tailor. Well, I have promised to give my daughter's hand and have the kingdom to the man who can do it and other things. What other things? said the little tailor. Oh, it will be time to learn that when you have got the boar. Then the little tailor went out to the wood where the boar was last seen, and when he came near him he ran away, and ran away, and ran away, till at last he came to a little chapel in the wood into which he ran, and the boar at his heels. He climbed up to a high window and got outside the chapel, and then rushed around to the door and closed and locked it. Then he went back to the king and said to him, I have your wild boar for you in the chapel in the woods. Send some of your men to kill him, or do what you like with him. How did you manage to get him there? said the king. Oh, I caught him by the bristles and threw him in there, as I thought you wanted to have him safe and sound. What's the next thing I must do? Well, said the king, there's a unicorn in this country killing everyone that he meets. I do not want him slain. I want him caught and brought to me. So the little tailor said, Give me a rope and a hatchet, and I will see what I can do. So he went with the rope and hatchet to the wood, where the unicorn had been seen, and when he came towards it he dodged it, and he dodged it, till at last he dodged it behind a big tree, till the unicorn, in trying to pierce, ran his horn into the tree, where it stuck fast. Then the little tailor came forth and tied the rope around the unicorn's neck and dug out the horn with his hatchet, and dragged the unicorn to the king. "'What's the next thing?' said the little tailor. "'Well, there is only one thing more. There are two giants who are destroying everybody they meet. Get rid of them, and my daughter and the half of my kingdom shall be yours.' Then the little tailor went to seek the giants and found them sleeping under some trees in the woods. He filled his box with stones, climbed up a tree overlooking the giants, and when he had hidden himself in the branches, he threw a stone at the chest of one of the giants, who woke up and said to his brother giant, What are you doing there? And the other giant woke up and said, I have done nothing. Well, don't do it again, said the other giant, and laid down to sleep again. Then the tailor threw a stone at the other giant, and hit him a whack on the chin. That giant rose up and said to his fellow giant, What do you do that for? Do what? Hit me on the chin. I didn't. You did. I didn't. You did? Well, take that for not doing it. And with that, the other giant hit him a rousing blow on the head. With that, they commenced fighting and tore up the trees and hit one another till at last one of them was killed, and the other was so badly injured that the tailor had no difficulty in killing him with his hatchet. Then he went back to the king and said, I have got rid of your giants for you. Send your men and bury them in the forest. 
They tore up the trees and tried to kill me with them, but I was too much for them. Now for the princess. Well, the king had nothing more to say, and gave him his daughter in marriage, and half the kingdom to rule. But shortly after they were married, the princess heard the tailor saying in his sleep, Fix that button better, base that side gore, don't drop your stitches like that. And then she knew she had married a tailor, and she went to her father weeping bitterly and complained. Well, my dear, he said, I promised, and he certainly showed himself a great hero. But I will try and get rid of him for you. Tonight I will send into your bedroom a number of soldiers that shall slay him, even if he can kill a dozen at a blow. So that night the little tailor noticed there was something wrong, and heard the soldiers moving about near the bedroom. So he pretended to fall asleep, and called out in his sleep, I have killed a dozen at a blow. I have slain two giants. I have caught a wild boar by his bristles, and captured a unicorn alive. Show me the man that I need fear. And when the soldiers heard that, they said to the princess that the job was too much for them, and went away. And the princess thought better of it, and was proud of her little hero, and they lived happily ever afterwards. End of A Dozen at a Blow by Joseph Jacobs Three Minutes to Twelve Author Unknown This is a LibriVox recording. Read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On a cold December night some twenty years ago, when the earth was bound in a black frost and the bitter wind blew strong and shrewdly, I was returning home from spending the evening at a friend's house, situated some three or four miles out of town. The sky was so black, the country lanes were so dark, that I was truly thankful when the scattered lights of an outlying suburb began to twinkle in the distance, and it was with a sigh of relief that I stopped under the first lamp post I came to and looked at my watch. It was no easy task, for the lamp glass had a pane broken, and the strong wind blew the gas in all directions and almost extinguished it. I read the time at last, three minutes to twelve, and looking up from my watch face i started to see a man standing close opposite me i had heard nothing of his approach we looked at each other but a moment yet it was time sufficient to imprint his features indelibly on my memory a tall shabby man in a threadbare black frock coat and a seedy tall hat his face lantern-jawed and sallow his eyes sunken and lustreless his beard long and ill-trimmed. In a tone of elaborate civility, he asked me the time, thanked me for my answer, and giving me a good night, passed into the black darkness which seemed to engulf him like a grave. I turned for a moment to think of his lonely walk in that grim obscurity, and resumed my homeward way laughing at myself for the start he had given me and reflecting that the strong wind had blown away the sound of his approach i thought of him as i sat and smoked my pipe over my fire and felt a comfortable shudder steal upon me as i imagined him facing the bitter blast in his insufficient clothing in the course of a week or two the incident trifling enough heaven knows faded from my memory and i thought no more of it in those days I was actively engaged in the timber trade, and the course of my business took me a good deal about the country, and brought me largely in contact with the agents of the different noblemen and country gentlemen of the district. With one of these agents who resided near the country town of L, I had numerous transactions, and I often used to run down to L to meet him, for the town was only fifteen miles away and was on a line of railway. It was a dull little hole enough that only warmed up into life when the militia were out or the assizes were on. One night I returned from L, having just made a large purchase from my friend the agent, whose master, a sporting nobleman, was reduced to cut down the family timber. When I fell asleep that night I had a very simple but vivid dream. I thought I was standing on a lofty hill, 
by my side stood a veiled figure who with a commanding gesture motioned me towards the town of l which lay in the far distance then i awoke of course i explained the thing to myself easily enough i had been a good deal engaged in the neighbourhood of the place and had a large venture more or less remotely connected with it still the dream was so vivid that i could not dismiss it from my thoughts during the whole of the day and when i went to bed at night i wondered if it would again visit me it did come precisely the same dream in precisely the same manner once more i found a convincing explanation doubtless i had been thinking too much about the first dream and this had given rise to the second but my explanation did not convince me in the least again i was haunted by the thing throughout the day and when i came home at night my preoccupation was so evident that it attracted the attention of my wife she questioned me upon the cause and only too thankful to unbosom myself of what was now almost a trouble i told her about the dream and its repetition she had the tact not to laugh at me but was evidently little impressed by the narrative the third night it came again if anything more vividly and startling than before this time i was utterly unhinged the pale face that fronted me in the looking-glass was hardly recognizable for my own i went down to breakfast filled with a foreboding of some misfortune bad news in my letters i knew not what the maid entered with the letter-bag there said my wife passing me a letter on which was the l postmark that breaks your dream john i opened it hurriedly it was from the agent requesting me to meet him at l that day at one o'clock to arrange a difficulty that had arisen in the performance of his contract i was intensely relieved here was an opportunity to go to l and perhaps the very fact of going would put me right there were two fast trains to l in the morning but i decided to go by the first regardless of the fact that i should have some hours to wait so i found myself shortly in the first-class compartment speeding away towards my destination the carriage was full pipes exhausted their fragrance newspapers were turned and flattened and there was that leisurely kind of morning conversation that prevails among men going off by an early train to their day's work i soon discovered that i had fallen amongst a party of barristers and their chief topic was a peculiarly interesting case which was to be finished to-day at the l assizes he must sum up against the prisoner said a gentleman with a fat florid face and long sandy whiskers who wore a light overcoat and a shepherd's plaid trousers the defence was a complete failure and deserved to be it was certainly rather audacious returned a clean-shaven young man with a double eyeglass who sat opposite me but i don't like circumstantial evidence all evidence is more or less circumstantial answered he of the florid complexion and this man is as clearly guilty to my mind as if there had been a dozen witnesses to stand by and see him do the deed that's my opinion hayward and the oracle disappeared behind its newspaper feeling glad to discover any topic that would divert my thoughts from their gloomy forebodings i addressed myself to hayward the young barrister with whom i had a slight acquaintance you seem much interested in this trial that is going on i said may i ask if you're engaged upon it no he answered but it is a curious case a man a clerk dismissed from his employment is accused of murdering the cashier of the firm the evidence against him is clearly circumstantial but the defence broke down at the most critical point and the case certainly looks very black for the prisoner the train was now slacking speed and there was a general rising i rose too are you going to get out here said mr hayward opening the door as we glided into the station have you come down so early on business y yes i said wishing to goodness i knew what the immediate business was nothing very urgent though i added half to myself as i got out if you have time to spare you had better turn in and hear the end of the trial said hayward the court will be crowded with ladies no doubt but i can smuggle you into a corner not knowing what to do with myself for the next two hours i accepted the offer with gratitude i was soon seated in an obscure corner of a dingy ill-lighted ill-ventilated courthouse which would have been ill-smelling too had it not been for the scent wafted from the numerous ladies who were present 
one of these a buxom female obstruction who ought to have known better was just in front of me and blocked my view with an enormous bonnet i could not see the prisoner or his counsel or even the clock over his head at which people kept looking eagerly as the hour fixed for the recommencement of the trial approached at last there was a stir and bustle caused by persons invisible to me then a call for silence and after a few preliminaries the summing up commenced i listened the more intently because i could see nothing the clear cold telling sentences cut deep into my consciousness how distinct and convincing it all was how all those minute facts the mute testimony of footmarks and the like arranged and distributed by that powerful intellect grouped themselves into the damning proof of guilt i cared nothing for the prisoner had no personal interest in the trial but my mind was wonderfully fascinated by this tale of horror at length the weighty tone ceased and a murmur of relief and expectation ran round the assembly at this moment the woman with the huge bonnet shifted her seat and i obtained a full view of the prisoner i started involuntarily where had i seen that face before the jury returned after a short absence the verdict was guilty accompanied with a recommendation to mercy again the judge's solemn tones sounded through the court again they ceased there was dead silence i sprang to my feet as if impelled to do so by some unseen power and looked steadily at the prisoner his face was averted from me for the moment but the looks of the people showed that he was about to speak slowly he turned round and in a voice whose deep earnest tones could be heard all over the assembly he said there lives but one man who can prove me innocent and there he stands with white face and outstretched arm he pointed at me i gazed at him with a sudden flash of recognition it was the man i had seen under the lamp and by strange coincidence at this moment the court clock struck twelve the plea that had been set up by the defence was an alibi but there was a space of some two hours that could not be accounted for and the theory of the prosecution was that the crime had been committed during that time my evidence supplied the missing link for the place in which i had seen the man was so far distant from the scene of the murder that it was impossible for him to have been anywhere near it at the time of its commission and the dream only a coincidence you will say perhaps or a fit of indigestion or my timber contract nevertheless as i have told you so it happened explain it away who can end of three minutes to twelve author unknown read by jennifer dahlman the twelve months a story for children translated from the french by e dyke this is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the 12th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Twelve Months Once upon a time there was a widow with whom lived two girls. One of these, Helen, was her own daughter. The other, Mariette, was her stepdaughter the child of her husband and his first wife. The woman adored Helen, but hated Mariette, because she was so much more beautiful than her half-sister. The poor child, who did not know how pretty she was, could not understand why the mere sight of her seemed to put her stepmother into a passion. She was said to do all the work of the house. She it was who prepared the meals, washed the dishes and the clothes, sewed and spun, while lazy helen spent her whole time in dressing herself up and lolling about at her ease mariette took all this rough treatment even the blows often rained upon her by the cruel woman and her daughter very meekly and patiently but her gentleness did not soften the stepmother's hard heart one day in january helen had a sudden whim go into the woods she said to her sister and gather a bunch of violets for me to fasten into my belt 
my dear sister said mariette what has put such an idea in your head you know quite well that no violets are to be found under the snow stupid girl stormed helen do you dare to answer back when i give you an order be off this instant and if you return without the violets you shall be treated to a good beating then mariette's stepmother took her by the shoulders pushed her out into the street and shut the door upon her crying bitterly the girl went to the woods where for a long time she wandered about tormented by hunger and perished with cold she even prayed that she might die and so be released from her misery all at once she saw high up in the distance a flickering light going towards it she reached the top of a mountain where a great fire was burning around the fire stood twelve blocks of stone and on each block sat a man three of the men were very young and beautiful and three who sat next to them were not quite so young the three next were old and the hair and beards of the remaining three were perfectly white all were silently gazing into the fire these twelve men were the twelve months of the year old january who had a very venerable appearance presided over the assembly holding a sceptre in his hand at sight of these silent figures mariette full of fear stood still her voice trembled as she murmured oh your pity good sirs let me warm myself at your fire i am frozen dignified old january bowed his head which was his way of saying yes what brings you here my child he asked i have come looking for violets but this is not the right time of year for them don't you know that they are never to be found under the snow i know it and yet if i do not find any my mother and sister will beat me terribly oh please do do tell me where i may find some old january rose from his seat and handed his sceptre to the youngest of the twelve men up march he said take my place march obeyed seating himself on the highest stone he held out his sceptre over the fire in a moment the flames leaped up the snow began to melt the trees to bud the grass to grow and there under the bushes were the sweet little violets make haste and gather them my dear said march and mariette gathered a beautiful bunch then after thanking the twelve men she went home scarcely had she quitted the spot when january taking back his sceptre caused the flames to sink down again snow covered the mountain and a bleak wind whistled beneath the darkening sky the stepmother was very much astonished to see mariette returning with the violets she called helen who by way of thanks said only where did you get them on top of the mountain replied the other girl where i saw a great many the next day helen sitting comfortably by the fireside said that she longed for strawberries and ordered her sister to fetch some as before the widow turned mariette out of doors threatening her with dire punishment if she did not immediately obey the girl went as quickly as possible to the mountain top where she saw again the twelve men sitting in silence around their fire what here again little one said old january kindly and what do you want now strawberries if i go home without them i shall be dreadfully beaten january rose went to the man whose seat faced his own and gave the sceptre into his hands up june he said take my place june seated himself on the tallest stone when he held the sceptre over the fire the flames leapt up even higher than when march had ruled them the snow vanished in a moment trees in full foliage adorned the green fields flowers of all kinds studded the grass and on every side was heard the sweet singing of birds it was summer at the foot of a tree some fine strawberries were ripening in the sunshine mariette joyfully filled her basket which her stepmother had thrust into her hands when she turned her out and after thanking her kind friends went home 
as before january immediately resumed his sceptre and his seat and sent the icy wind careening over the country the widow and her daughter could scarcely believe their eyes when mariette brought in the strawberries they ate all of them without giving her one on the following day helen told her sister to go fetch some apples from the woods but i should not find them in midwinter said the girl it is impossible impossible is it sneered helen we shall see about that and if you return with empty hands we will beat you to death terrified mariette fled to the mountain top the twelve men saw her when she was still at some distance from them yet again my poor child cried january how is this oh sir sobbed mariette my sister and stepmother will kill me unless i can find some apples up september and take my place said good january september seated himself on the tallest stone and held the sceptre over the fire the flames jumped up a little higher the snow began to melt but the trees though they had a few leaves were losing them one by one as they fell and strewed the ground in the midst of a meadow stood a grand apple tree laden with fruit mariette ran to it joyously and shook it a beautiful rosy apple fell at her feet she picked it up eagerly and again shook the tree a second apple fell as she stooped to take it september called out to her make haste and return my child it is late and you might lose your way mariette thanked him prettily then ran back to the house as quickly as her feet could carry her the stepmother and sister were astonished those two fine apples made their mouths water helen snatched one from her sister where did you get them she asked in a rough tone up yonder on the mountain where there are a great many replied mariette then why did you not bring me more you have eaten the others by the way you greedy creature and the wicked girl gave her sister two resounding slaps mariette crying took refuge in the kitchen while the others enjoyed the apples i shall go to the mountain to-day said helen the next morning it will amuse me to gather the apples and i will bring back a lot her mother tried in vain to dissuade her the obstinate spoiled child would have her own way she put on a fur cloak threw the hood over her head and set off for the mountain the snow was so deep that no trace of a path could be seen helen lost herself but after wandering about for a long time she saw at length a light and went towards it this light of course came from the fire around which sat the twelve months helen rather fearful at first soon recovered herself and without troubling to ask permission calmly walked up to the fire and began to warm her hands what are you doing here inquired january what is that to you old idiot said rude helen mind your own business she left the fire and went in search of the apple tree old january said nothing he only frowned and shook his long beard and as soon as he did that the sky grew darker lower and lower sank the fire the flames died down leaving only a few red coals the snow began to fall in huge flakes and an icy howling blast swept across the mountain helen in the darkness and blinded by the snow again lost her way she wandered miserably to and fro until overcome by fatigue she sank on the ground then in spite of her fur cloak her limbs were soon benumbed, and during that cold night she was frozen to death. Her mother, finding that she did not return, became terribly anxious. Thinking that Helen might be lingering to eat the apples, she put on her outdoor garments and went in search of her. When the woman came near to the mountain, she called loudly. There was no reply she then attempted to climb the hill but the wind and snow were too much for her and in a few moments she fainted and fell thus she too was killed by the cold mariette left alone in the house made ready a meal put everything in order and then sat down to her spinning-wheel 
when night came and the widow and her daughter were still absent good little marriott felt very anxious and remained all night at the window hoping every moment to see them return the next day some woodcutters came to the house bearing two frozen corpses which they had found in the woods the tender-hearted girl wept when she thought of the sad end of these two who had caused her so much suffering she was now sole mistress of the house and there she lived until by and by her good sense and beauty won for her the heart and hand of a good man who made her life a very happy one this ends the twelve months translated from the french by e dyke read for you by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in july two thousand seventeen Mezzogiorno Alpino by Josue Carducci. This is a LibriVox recording. Read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Mezzogiorno Alpino. Nel gran cerchio delle Alpi, sul granito squallido e scialbo, su ghiacciai cadenti, regna, sereno intenso ed infinito nel suo grande silenzio il mezzodì pini ed abeti senz'aura di venti si drizzano nel sol che gli penetra sola garrisce in picciol suon di cetra l'acqua che tenue tra i sassi fluì end of mezzogiorno alpino by Giosuè carducci read by fabiola The Twelve Huntsmen by the Brother Grimm. This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the twelfth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There was once a king's son who had a bride whom he loved very much and when he was sitting beside her and very happy news came that his father lay sick unto death and desired to see him once again before his end then he said to his beloved i must now go and leave you i give you a ring as a remembrance of me when i am king i will return and fetch you so he rode away and when he reached his father the latter was dangerously ill and near his death he said to him dear son i wished to see you once again before my end promise me to marry as i wish and he named a certain king's daughter who was to be his wife the son was in such trouble that he did not think what he was doing and said yes dear father your will shall be done and thereupon the king shut his eyes and died when therefore the son had been proclaimed king and the time of mourning was over he was forced to keep the promise which he had given his father and caused the king's daughter to be asked in marriage and she was promised to him his first betrothed heard of this and fretted so much about his faithfulness that she nearly died then her father said to her dearest child why are you so sad you shall have whatsoever you will she thought for a moment and said dear father i wish for eleven girls exactly like myself in face figure and size the father said if it be possible your desire shall be fulfilled and he caused a search to be made in his whole kingdom until eleven young maidens were found who exactly resembled his daughter in face figure and size when they came to the king's daughter she had 12 suits of huntsman clothes made all alike and the 11 maidens had to put on the huntsman clothes and she herself put on the 12th suit thereupon she took her leave of her father and rode away with them and rode to the court of her former betrothed whom she loved so dearly then she asked if he required any huntsmen and if he would take all of them 
into his service the king looked at her and did not know her but as they were such handsome fellows he said yes and that he would willingly take them and now they were the king's 12 huntsmen the king however had a lion which was a wondrous animal for he knew all conceit and secret things it came to pass that one evening he said to the king you think you have 12 huntsmen yes said the king they are 12 huntsmen the lion continued you are mistaken they are 12 girls the king said that cannot be true how will you prove that to me oh just let some peas be strewn in the ante chamber answered the lion and then you will soon see men have a firm step and when they walk over peas none of them stir but girls trip and skip and drag their feet and the peas roll about the king was well pleased with the counsel and caused the peas to be strewn there was however a servant of the king's who favored the huntsmen and when he heard that they were going to be put to this test he went to them and repeated everything and said the lion wants to make the king believe that you are girls then the king's daughter thanked him and said to her maidens show some strength and step firmly on the peas so next morning when the king had the 12 huntsmen called before him and they came into the antechamber where the peas were lying they stepped so firmly on them and had such a strong sure walk that thought one of the peas either rolled or skipped then they went away again and the king said to the lion you have lied to me they walk just like men the lion said they have been informed that they were going to be put to the test and have assumed some strength just let 12 spinning wheels be brought into the antechamber and they will go to them and be pleased with them and that is what no man would do the king liked the advice and had the spinning wheels placed in the antechamber but the servant who was well disposed to the huntsmen went to them and disclosed the project so when they were alone the king's daughter said to her eleven girls show some constraint and do not look round at the spinning wheels and next morning when the king had the 12 huntsmen summoned they went through the antechamber and never once looked at the spinning wheels then the king again said to the lion you have deceived me they are men for they have not looked at the spinning wheels the lion replied they have restrained themselves the king however would no longer believe the lion the 12 huntsmen always followed the king to the chase and his liking for them continually increased now it came to pass that once when they were out hunting news came that the king's bride was approaching when the true bride heard that it hurt her so much that her heart was almost broken and she fell fainting to the ground the king thought something had happened to his dear huntsmen ran up to him wanted to help him and drew his glove off then he saw the ring which he had given to his first bride and when he looked in her face he recognized her then his heart was so touched that he kissed her and when she opened her eyes he said you are mine and i am yours and no one in the world can alter that he sent a messenger to the other bride and entreated her to return to her own kingdom for he had a wife already and someone who had just found an old key did not require a new one thereupon the wedding was celebrated and the lion was again taken into favor because after all he had told the truth end of the 12 huntsmen by the brother grim se bate miezul nopții de Mihai Eminescu a citit în limba română Livia aceasta este o înregistrare LibriVox citită în cinstea celei de a 12-a aniversări a LibriVox toate înregistrările LibriVox sunt în domeniul public pentru mai multe informații sau pentru a deveni voluntar 
te rog să vizitezi LibriVox.org. Se bate miezul nopții. Se bate miezul nopții în clopotul de aramă și somnul vameș vieții nu vrea să-mi ieie vamă. Pe căi bătute adesea vrea mintea să mă poarte, să asamăn într-o altă viață și cu moarte. Ci cum până gândirimi și azi nu se mai schimbă, căci între amândouă stă neclintita limbă. Sfârșitul poeziei se bate miezul nopții de Mihai Eminescu.